Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, welcome to this SEAM sem sem seminar. We are very pleased and delighted to have distinguished Professor Sanjay Sampa giving this presentation on thermal spray for additive and layered manufacturing. Professor Sampath has a distinguished career, originally a graduate of the Indian Institute of Technology at the Banaras Hindu University, the university which I consider as a seat of metallurgy. He then came to Stony Brook University of Long Island to complete his PhD. Then he transitioned to industry for quite a few years before he took the leap back to Stony Brook University. He established the Center of Thermal Spray Research and interacts with companies and has interacted with companies for the last 20 to 30 years. Professor Sunbath has bagged many awards. He has bagged the most prestigious awards from the TMS and from ASM due to his research interactions with industry and fundamental research. And I'm sure that he'll bag more awards in the near future. It is indeed our pleasure to now listen to distinguished Professor Sanjay Sampath. Thank you, Sanjay. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I hope uh, all of you can hear me. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Chris, Vesna, and John for organizing all of the logistics here and and notably of course to Chris for inviting me to present um, in this forum. Uh, I remember the journey that Chris uh, started on the SEAM proposal that started I think two or three years ago and he was assembling uh, all of the um, international collaborations and it's nice to see SEAM come to fruition. I think these kinds of uh, interactions are e extremely important, uh, especially for education uh, in my my view. So what I'm going to do today is share with you some sort of new uh, ideas. Chris and I, as you know, are both um, uh, students of thermal spray and we, we basically are um, uh, have been doing this this subject. Uh, we've fallen in love with the subject for a long time now and uh, we think thermal spray is the coolest thing in the world. Um, and uh, but what has happened of late is that there has been uh, a lot of this fusion between industrial interest and academic research. And that's what I intend to share with you today. So I'm going to take kind of a new spin on this whole genre of additive uh, manufacturing. Um, I just wanted to give you this in this cover slide a framework for all of the events that goes on in thermal spray, which are rather complex from fluid dynamics to heat transfer to chemistry to physics to solidification to mechanics and so on. So needless to say that uh, I, I cannot take credit for uh, this, this work except to say that this was a large collaborative effort for many decades starting at Stony Brook with Herb Herman. Uh, and then Chris Burnt was here, then I came, and then there's been a successive set, set of graduates, postdocs, visiting scholars, and so on and so forth. So, I, you know, I, I'd like to acknowledge them as well as all of our sponsors, which has been diverse over the years. This particular project on multilayers is currently being um, uh, supported by Air Force Office of Scientific Research, again, as part of an international collaboration. Uh, it looks like my screen is frozen. Um, no, it's working. So uh, I think most of you know what is thermal spray. It's a basically a way to project particles, um, molten particles typically, um, by uh, first heating them um, and subjecting them to phase change in some sort of a thermal device. And then these individual droplets that are created from powders are then propelled on the substrate where they form these lamellae or these pancakes, these tiny droplets that are frozen and then the cascading impact of all of these successive particles ends up giving you a coating. So in, in sort of in a simplistic way, we are all uh, glorified spray painters, except instead of using organic, inorganic mixtures, we are using uh, solid particles and using thermal sources, or in some cases cold spray, which is just kinetic energy to create these processes. So it's been a, a surface engineering tool for a long time. Um, 
And the nice thing about thermal spray, why it has captivated the attention of the industry for a long time, over 100 years now, is that you have diverse ways to generate thermal energy or kinetic energy. And because of that, you can do large different, different types of materials. And in the process, uh, it gives you tremendous amount of flexibility. So it's almost like having a toolbox with lots of different tools to chisel away at different problems that one uh, needs to address. And that's one of the sort of the cornerstones of the process's flexibility. Um, and, you know, if, if you were to classify this from a surface engineering, because you're just a surface engineering forum, I tried to lay out this slide to illustrate what's the difference, where does thermal spray fit in? And clearly we don't use gas based processes like vacuum evaporation or sputtering, and we don't use electrochemical processes, which is a solution based process. Thermal spray fits into either a liquid or a solid or a semi solid uh, deposition process consisting of these discrete particles and not atoms. So these are actually mesoscale particles in the tens of microns. And why do we use thermal spray? We use it for sort of four broad categories. I'm sure you can classify them in different ways. First is what we call duality of function. You've got a substrate that has to perform a particular uh, load bearing capability, but you want the coating to protect it against the environment like the landing gear or hydraulic cylinder rod. You want to put a high value added material on a low cost substrate. Uh, that's a second example, mostly for things like interconnect, advanced oxides, bond coats, things of that kind. You can enhance performance, whether it is for implant by depositing a bone mimicking material or a thermal barrier to allow the hot gases to run harder while preventing the substrate from getting impingement heating. That's what we call thermal barrier, and I'll get into that. And last is an opportunity for reclamation. If you've got like cylinder heads or, or crankshafts or a lot of uh, industrial machinery where the coating allows us to either first serve as a platform for rebuilding, where if the coating wears away, you can rebuild the coating, or in cases where it's completely worn out like cylinders, you can actually bring it back, which is now considered uh, uh, remanufacturing. Um, so this is this technology because of all of these attributes is used widely by many industries. The gas turbine is one of the leading users, the, both the aero and then the spill off to the land based gas turbines. You've got, of course, the landing gears that I talked about, the hydraulic cylinder rods, paper machinery, wherever you want a surface that provides either a protection or some sort of a function, you want to use them. And then you've got lots of automotive components, including the cylinder bore, which is now widely done. I'd already talked about implants, infrastructure, and also things and components used in semiconductor manufacturing. So this is a broad, uh, diverse group of industries. Estimates are anywhere from eight to 10 billion. This is the kind of the industries, industrial utilization of thermal spray. Um, now, even though thermal spray is widely used, it's actually a very difficult process to understand fundamentally. Why? Because you got two phase changes. If you're a material scientist, you know what I'm talking about. You take particles that are in almost near ambient condition, like what you see here, and you inserted them to extremely intense heat sources in extremely short time scales. So within this time scale, they go through melting. In many cases, they'll go through evaporation or preferential evaporation. And once you're done with that process, you almost immediately within you know, a particle traveling a couple of hundred meters per second, you freeze the process by rapidly quenching these particles. And so what you end up getting is this two back-to-back -back phase transformations that are taking place in extremely short time scales. Very few uh, processes experience this kind of uh, you know, extreme conditions. Second, these are particles are highly con constrained because of their anisotropic nature high impact conditions, extremely rapid solidifications, so they build up enormous amounts of stresses. And then the last is most of these layers are assemblies of small particles, so invariably you end up getting a porosity, and of course you get what we call multi-scale structures. As you see over here, you've got these splats that are one micron thick, coatings that are millimeter dimensions, but the features within the splats are in the nanometer dimension. So you've got all of these complexities of material science and mechanics and chemistry and thermal proper aspects all happening together. So thermal spray is easy to do, but very hard to perfect. Um, this is an example from Japan, from Kintaro Shinoda and others, 
who actually imaged in, at a million frames per second particles impinging on a sub substrate. And you can see all the violent attributes associated with these uh, impacting particles and the breakup and the fluid dynamic instabilities. And, and this is just talking about the fact that not only is the process complex, but also the way these deposit forms and all of the second order effects are also incredibly complicated. Um, uh, so because of all of these reasons, uh, and there was a clear desire to bring interdisciplinary thinking into this, and this is what led to um, at Stony Brook having uh, uh, the, what we call an NSF MRSEC, Chris, myself, and Herb Herman. We were the three musketeers trying to uh, convince or con, whichever way you want to call it, NSF to saying that it was convinced, of course, that uh, you uh, need interdisciplinary thinking to build a scientific framework for this area. And that was successful in uh, getting us through for 10 years of, like your seem, a big program that brought lots of people together. And then since about 2002, 2003, we had to now find other sources of funding to keep us going which is what we refer to as a consortium for thermal spray technology, where every company contributes a small amount of money, but as a pooled resource, we've been able to keep this infrastructure in terms of facilities and people now almost for 20 years, 25 years actually. Um, and this is just a rough history of it. I'll skip this in the interest of time. But what I wanted to do is to share with you what, how all of these uh, discrete components were integrated. So we, we studied plume particle interactions that was largely associated with how, uh, you know, thermal chemical phenomena, thermal physical phenomena and fluid dynamic phenomena took place as these particles were injected to the torch. Then we studied how these deposits form. We looked at the attributes of it using advanced methods like these characterization techniques. And lastly, we are constantly developing new ways to measure properties of these complex layered solids. Um, um, industry is starting to adapt a lot of these capabilities now, especially through this consortium, which is a very vigorous partnership that uh, has been going on for 20 years. Uh, a lot of what I'm talking about is captured in this article. Um, it's a free download. Um, it's available on our website um, and you can read how we evolved this, this uh, this center over the last 20 years. And of course, our one of our biggest attributes is of course our human resources, which over the years we've built uh, quite substantially uh, in this arena. So let me uh, uh, let me talk, get to the essence of the problem today. So wide ranging coating architectures that we use, they're all generally um, possible because of the way these layered, or layered droplets form. We can classify them into two parts. One is what we refer to as generally monolithic coatings, which means that the coating is the same through the entire thickness. They may have all kinds of discrete, discrete defects and attributes within them, but overall you can call them as at least uniform through the thickness, a monolithic single layer, even if it's a dual phase material like a cermet, but they're uniform through the thickness. You can add porosity as another feature of the coating or another phase within the coating. That's one part. Then, of course, you have the opportunity to mix materials. That's a very unique attribute of thermal spray to make composites. For in this example that I'm showing here, uh, we have mixed two magnetic phases, a ceramic oxide magnetic phase and a metallic magnetic phase. We combine them to add certain magnetic attributes without compromising the interface because it's rapidly quenched or you can make graded materials by sequentially changing the way the deposits are formed, or we can make multi-layers by stacking the layers. So you can see that thermal spray allows you to create lots of different nuanced microstructures. How can we harness this power to create designer microstructures, which is sort of the, the goal that we seek. Um, most of the coatings, either they're made even if they're iso iso even they're through thickness homogeneous, uh, quote unquote homogeneous, they still are some form of layer structures. Either they experience thermal conditions that provide a gradient like an thermal barrier because every segment of the coating is experiencing a different temperature, even if the coating is homogeneous. Um, so you can you have to consider the fact that a lot of these are have to be treated from the point of view of layered architectures and in the form of either materials or in the form of exposure conditions. Um, and of course, 
there are discrete or deliberate uh, uh, multi layers like uh, in solid oxide fuel salts where each layer is supposed to perform a different function. Environmental barrier coatings where you're adding different layers to combat different attributes. Or if you want to make thick coatings, many times you want to have a gradual transition in the uh, mixtures of metal and ceramic to min minimize interfacial resistance. Or again, you can make discrete electronic devices by stacking uh, thick films of individual metals and ceramic materials. So there's lots of opportunities here. A lot of this started with this idea of a graded coating, where if you layered the materials in such a way that you discretize the interface and gradually change them, then you essentially eliminate sharp interfaces and therefore you can extend the durability of these systems and make these coatings thick. So, so these are all the past things, but now let me take a step back and think about this problem in a kind of a different way. So most coatings today are what I would call unintentional layered structures. So which means we deposit these, we form these droplets. They have a dimension anywhere from 0.2 to 2 microns if you're a splat, but if you were to make a, a, a discrete layer, you can't do them at one to two microns. You need to build lots of these splats to get sort of a controllable 10 to 15 micron layer. And then of course your deposit can go from say 50 to 100 microns to all the way to millimeter dimensions. Now these are some of the dimensions that we can live, we can today do with particles as you see in this picture, but you can use solutions and suspensions and maybe bring these thing numbers further down into maybe in the nanometer level followed by uh, things. Now, uh, there's a lot of hierarchy within them, and I'm not going to go into the detail. Our focus is going to be mesoscale. That is in the tens of microns of dimensions, we want to intentionally manipulate and modify. We have to live with these hierarchies in the sub 10 micron and the nanometer scale, which is almost unavoidable, uh, unavoidable because of the rapid quenching nature of these processes. So we are really stuck at the bigger length scale and not able to tune very well in the smaller length scales. So the other aspect is that these, these coatings, even though even if you make a homogeneous coating, you may have strong gradients and stresses because of the layer by layer assembly. This is a, a, a simulation from my colleague, Professor Nakamura, about how the layer by layer stresses build up in the system as the coating is depositing and undergoing cooling. Uh, so there is a gradient in stresses that is also present in these, and that is something that we need to remember and understand. So these are all the attributes. So first I showed you examples of the different uh, past applications, then I talked about some of the features of it and the attributes. Now I want to segue to talk about, I, these are all our historical knowledge building exercises. Now can I use this knowledge to impart unique functionality by intentionally assembling these tens of microns layers. As I said, I'm going to ignore the submicrons, but I'm going to focus on the tens of microns and see what can I do with that level of control that I have. So I can do this in five different ways or four different ways plus one integrated way. The, the, the left top is basically I can change the process on the fly. For example, I can change the density I can change the number of layers or the interfaces, and also I can change the deposition temperature, which governs how these lamella layer bond. So that's what I call process controlled uh, layer manufacturing. On the right top, you see uh, where I can discreetly change the materials. I can call them, we can make laminates or what we call graded coatings. Again, by in this case, I'm, I'm controlling the material. In the third example at the bottom, I can actually control the stresses layer by layer by intentionally manipulating the process conditions and how the materials behave. And on the left corner, I can use these combinations to change the properties discreetly in the system. And lastly, I can in integrate all of these events or capabilities in unique ways or in synthesized ways that will allow us to uh, provide extremely novel um, layered uh, architectures both now in the in the through thickness direction, which is one dimensional, or a combination of through thickness and in plane, which is two dimensional. And I'm going to give you examples of both in this in this things. So I have I have sort of four ideas here, but I'm only going to talk about a couple because of the in, in the limited time. 
Uh, first is the TBCs, the second is the oxide thermoelectrics. I I'm going to skip the bioinspired, maybe give you a quick example. And then the last one is discreetly embedding sensors as part of a multi-layer assembly. Um, so let's talk about the first example of how thermal spray is extremely powerful to allow us to engender new functionalities, which we didn't quite understand uh, before the scientific framework had developed to this level. So most of you may be familiar with thermal barrier coatings. They are now a household word in the uh, turbo machinery industry. Um, some 60,000 engines all over the world have these thermal barrier coatings on them, and essentially they act as a heat shield. So in the case of a combustor, this is our, these are coated tiles that prevents the heat from going into the uh, substrate, allowing the system to operate hotter, reduce cooling, and therefore improving efficiency. Or I can also coat things like the veins and blades that would allow, again, these uh, uh, coatings to provide a strong thermal gradient that allows the engine to run hotter while the substrate remains colder or reduced with the amount of cooling. So these TBCs are very widespread in utilization, and I'll discuss that more. And But the TBCs experience all kinds of complexities in the environment, whether it is in flight or in land-based power generation. So you can see from this cartoon in the bottom here that because of the intense temperatures and thermal gradients, you can have oxidation-induced uh, delamination or failure. You can have small particles that are getting ingested into the engine. They can create erosion. You can have things discrete, large objects that can show up in flight and cause the coating to get impacted. And that's what we call foreign object damage. So these are mechanical, there is chemical or thermochemical, and then you have thermochemical where things like, you know, you can have um, um, ash, volcanic ash or um, uh, lignite ash and uh, sand uh, that can basically become molten at these uh, temperatures and become like a thermal spray particle. They infiltrate and then they basically peel off the coating. So now you have a coating that is so important to these 60,000 engines, but it's experiencing all these complex uh, problems associated with it. Um, and these coatings have become incredibly important enablers. This graph on the right, right bottom, you can see how the temperature as a function of years has progressed. You can see the super alloys have not progressed that much. It's still very impressive, but it's 100 degrees in about 50 years. But you added cooling, you added TBCs, and now you're adding ceramic composites. You can see that there's been a leapfrog in the temperature capability of these systems by hundreds of degrees. We are now pushing 1500 degrees centigrade for the allowable impinge, uh, gas temperatures. So this has created a sort of a revolution in combined cycle efficiency of these engines and performance of uh, even flight turbines. And so these things have become a mainstay of our industry. Um, and, uh, and they need to perform, give you the thermal resistance, they have to be durable, and they have to provide life extension. Um, so if you look at this chart, it shows you how the thermal barrier industry has flourished. It has gone from, you know, in early stage inception in the 1960s to almost 2 million pounds of uh, ceramic materials get plasma sprayed every single year. So that's an impressive growth of the technology, and now annually, about 2 million pounds of these relatively thin, low, volume, low mass, uh, low volume structures, small volume structures are used widely in industry, both for the new equipment manufacture as well as the uh, um, overhaul and repair. Now, if you look at a TBC, you take a step back and you ask, what does it have to do? And it's extremely complicated. On the left, it has to provide the thermal barrier, but it has to stay on, it has to be durable. It has to accommodate oxidation of the bond code because zirconia allows oxygen to be, it's oxygen transparent. It will undergo changes with time and temperature because the ceramic porosity will intrinsically be susceptible to centering. And then I talked about these extrinsic effects like sand particles, erosion, and foreign object. Right? All this is happening while you also have to make these in these complex and chaotic ways. So you have to make them reliable, both from the point of view of processing, from and the geometry of the specimen is going to change from location to location, what gases you use, what fuel you use, and so on. So if you add these two together, it's a very complex problem. And 
and there are many ways to tackle it and industry does that in different ways. I won't belabor that, except you can change architecture, you can change materials and you can change processing nuances. So this has been a, a huge problem and a huge opportunity. And that's why if you look all over the world, thousands of papers have been written on the thermal barrier and it's still going strong, even though it was started 40 years ago. Now, uh, so if you look at these microstructures, you know, if you're a material scientist, you know, you show it to uh, somebody who does clean material science, they look at these microstructures, it's unbelievable that this thing even works. However, these porosities, these lamellae, these, cr these cracks are actually the important attributes that allow these coatings to be durable and provide low thermal conductivity. So the porosity and cracks allows the material to be strain tolerant to allow it to expand and contract with a dissimilar metal during its thermal cycling. And the porosity and the layers allow to take the already low thermal conductivity and make it significantly lower where it, the real benefits are, are obtained. Now these four different microstructures are all done by plasma spray, which is an impressive capability of a single process. And we can, within each one of these, I can further modify the microstructures and I can change the compliance of the thermal properties of the system. So this is like going to a, a restaurant and they ask you, which type of salad you want and how many different types of dressings that you want. And you know, it's the, the, the variety is also an enigma because it now forces you to think about what is the correct way to take these decisions. And that is the, uh, the challenge that's posed both on the industrial engineers and the academics. And what we want to do is shed light into the fundamentals that allows us to utilize these uh, flexibilities to our advantage. And so, Here's where uh, things get interesting. We typically want a coating to have high durability, which means you want high fracture toughness. That means you want the coating to be dense. You don't want defects in them. But if I make the coatings dense, its stiffness also goes up. So you want the stiffness in the opposite direction and you want porosity to help you with mitigating phonon transport. So the, the black goes up, the blue and the red goes in the opposite direction. So the coatings, has these conflicting requirements for durability and functionality. For functionality, you want things in a particular way, low stiffness, low conductivity, but for toughness, for durability, you want high toughness. So you got these three attributes all needed at the same time. Uh, can I use uh, location specific optimization by layered manufacturing to address all three concurrently? So let's start with the most typical failure mechanism. The typical failure mechanism is as you expose this material to time and temperature, the metal oxidizes preferentially. The, uh, you form what we call a thermally grown oxide, which is typically alumina, which is aided by the chromia in the solid solution. And that creates these instabilities in terms of stresses, generates small cracks, and these cracks link up and the entire coating falls off as you see here in this microstructure. So you've got tensile stress build up at the due to cycling, crack coalescence and coating scholation. So the parameter that's very of interest is two things. One is you want to minimize the driving force for this crack growth and nucleation. And of course you want the coating to resist this crack growth, which is given by the toughness of the ceramic. So we asked, her, asked a simple question. If that's what we want, then you want the coating to be porous because that minimizes the amount of driving force, which comes from the difference in thickness and stiffness and the substrate, while the interface is where all the action is. So what if we put a coating which has a very thin, but a dense layer, so it, it doesn't compromise the stiffness, but then leave the majority of the coating to be blank with the old porous coating. So when we did that, we create what's called a bilayer. So you take, uh, now all we've done to achieve this is sprayed the coating in two steps. Remember these coatings have similar thicknesses. This was done with a single process condition and this was done with two process conditions back to back where we changed the interfacial layer of about 60 microns with a thin dense layer, which we achieved by making a finer particle size cut while the rest of the coating remained porous and, and dark. When we did this, we got doubling of the durability or even more than doubling. So this shows that the theory works. Basically, you want to keep the coating porous to minimize 
the total stiffness, which will basically drive the crack, but you want the resistance to that crack to be strong by making that coating tougher at that interface. And the nice thing about this plasma spray is just beautiful to do this kind of experiments. And you can actually explain this theoretically by, by these kinds of graphs. You can plot a coating with high interface toughness and low effective in plane modulus, and that's what these bilayers are. And it turns out since the majority of the coating is porous, you also get the benefit of low conductivity while having high durability. So you get this simultaneous optimization of durability and functionality, all by changing into a layered manufacturing step. So that was very, gave us a lot of confidence. Then we asked our question that solves only one problem, which is this interfacial problem. What if I wanted to now change the surface problem? So what would an ideal TBC look like? Because now all of these properties have to be concurrently optimized. So ideal TBC would look like a dense layer at the interface, a porous layer which will be compliant and low conductivity, but then the surface also has to be dense. If I make the surface dense, then it'll increase stiffness and cause it to spall. So how do I manipulate that? I create essentially a three layer structure com comprising of dense porous, but we deliberately vertically crack the top layer with processing. So this is what we call a multifunctional three layer thermal barrier systems. And of course, the first thing we do is we test for the interfacial failure. And you can see that the same idea that worked for the bilayer also works for the trilayer. I added a thick dense layer in the top with even with cracks. So there's a small drop in durability, but nothing too bad. But the nice thing about this is now I can improve erosion resistance of this material, which you've done. In this case, it's all three as zirconia. But if you want to add sea mass or the sand ingestion, then you really want uh, zirconia will not do a good job. You need to go to gadolinium zirconate. So that allowed us to think about what would this architecture look like? Again, you've got the bond coat, the high toughness layer, a porous layer followed by a dense vertically crack layer, which is also produced by a processing conditions. And these are what we call process enabled design of these multi layers. And when we did that, we again get all of the benefits that are concurrently accrued, where we've got improvement in furnace cycle durability, we get CMAS resistance, we have erosion resistance because of the dense vertical crack nature. And so we try to satisfy these problems. We've done lots of different architectures of these, lots of papers have been published, and more notably, one of these architectures actually survived 8,000 hours in an actual gas turbine engine. So that was a very promising uh, development. Um, there's a lot of theory that also goes into how you design this. In the interest of time, I won't uh, go into the detail, but anybody wants copies of these papers, I can arrange to send that. My next example, and this will be very short, is to give you how we can now spatially engineer using thermal spray. And even though there are many application of functional materials, I'm gonna focus on the thermoelectric systems. Many of you probably know about thermoelectric materials. You've got the PN junctions where a heat gradient actually drives electron hole flow. And if you sequence these things in the correct way by plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, you can essentially convert waste heat into electricity. Easier said than done. There are not too many materials that do this. Um, and I'm giving you again a very short synopsis of this. The parameter that is of interest is what we call ZT, or the figure of merit, which is a combination of Seebeck coefficient, conductivity, therm electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, and temperature. Again, we face the same problem here as we saw in the thermal barrier problem. Seebeck coefficient is high for materials that's got high resistivity, and high resistivity materials are very bad because they provide too much heat resistance for the things. So you really want a good combination of S, uh, uh, you want a high S, high sigma, low K, and high T, all at the same time. And the world has been struggling to find materials that do all four of them, and people have not succeeded. Uh, they have, but there are very few materials. They're very difficult to process. They're very expensive to process. What we wanted to see is, can thermal spray fit into this application from the point of view of large scale applications? I won't get into a lot of the details. This is again published, but I want to show you one really interesting example where the processing actually allowed us to seek a novel material. And this was titanium oxide. It turns out titanium is very unstable in reducing environment. It very readily becomes substructure metric. 
And when it becomes substoichiometric, it becomes electrically conductive. But as an insulator, it does come up and give decent C back coefficient. So we played around with process spaces, and we found a combination of process conditions where we can introduce some of this TI6O11 material, but not too much of it. You still want decent amount of rutile to give you the C back but you want some conductivity aided by the substoichiometric or what we call Magnelli phases. And we were able to combine these process conditions to make a material that had a quite a decent figure of merit of about 0.13 or about 450 degrees centigrade, where this combination of microstructural features and the intrinsic attributes of the material allowed us to optimize all three of these properties and allow us to increase the temperature, which is very difficult to do with most, most conventional materials, and make a material that was not shabby from a point of view of an oxide. It's not good enough to do anything significant with it. But when we did that, we were able to make the device, make the material. Now, we, how do we make a device? We again want to think about how I can enhance the capabilities of thermal spray and layer manufacturing. So here we, you can see from the screen what's happening. You've got Basically, instead of building the structures vertically, we're building the structures laterally and allowing a thermal gradient in plane through the system and create a PN junction. We didn't have a good P-type material. The titanium was N-type. And so by putting a P-type, we just used nickel. Now we found another material, calcium cobaltate, which works really well. So now we have a true PN junction material. Again, I don't have time to discuss that in detail, but you can see how we take this planar approach and layered manufacturing and patterning. Now we add a mask to produce these patterns and you can start to stack these things one on top of one along the side of another. And so we can join materials in series or stack materials and connect them in parallel. When I do that, when I join materials in series, I increase the voltage. When I do that in parallel, I increase the current so I can get this simultaneous optimization of two attributes at the same time. That's again a real powerful capability of thermal spray. And so when you do that, you can make these 24 layer structures or 15 layers of coatings, and we can actually make devices that look sort of like this. So we connect in series in parallel, we apply the heat, <clears throat> and we, we stack 24, we make three layers with 24 thermocouples. So now we are creating all of these junctions that we are able to, in this example, we generated about a percent conversion with just one material. Um, we realized that these numbers are not that great, but you know, even solar cells started small, uh, but we now show how powerful this is for thermal spray. The other beauty of this approach is you now we can stack these thermal piles, we call them thermal piles, directly on like exhaust components. And even we had one application for wood stoves where we can use this to concurrently power a wood stove and keep things going uh, in storms and things of that kind. So that's the second example I wanted to show you. Um, uh, you can also use these ideas, learning from nature, make these what we call uh, knacker mimicking layers followed by hard layers, and you can create a really novel uh, mechanics guided uh, layers where you create uh, brittle uh, failure to accept large amounts of load followed by cascading ductile or semi high toughness layer to create a damage tolerant layer. Uh, the last example, and I'll finish with this, is the ability to combine additive approaches with layered manufacturing. And this is actually going back in history, about 20 years. Uh, at, at Stony Brook, we had a program funded by DARPA to make a plasma spray pen. So instead of having a plasma spray paint brush, the idea is to make it a pen with what we call precision writing. And, uh, and this uh, was something that uh, was rather novel. It took tremendous amount of effort to get here with a lot of funding, but um, this technology has now been developed and it's been commercialized by a standard based spinoff called uh, uh, Mesoscribe, which is run by uh, Dr. Jeff Brogan, one of uh, Chris's uh, graduates. And, uh, and the idea here is now I can print uh, lines and patterns, just like I showed in the previous case with masks, here I'm showing with, um, with, with without having using mass because then you can do it in three dimensions. Like this example I show with the turbine blade where you actually can write a circuit uh, without masks and put your feature where you want it. And this is an example of an actual written circuit. 
And in this example, we're showing uh, a thermocouple that's integrated as part of a thermal barrier assembly. So this term called smart coatings were coined by Lee Weiss and Fritz Prince at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, but they used masking. This is now allowing us to do with, with printing, and this is now actually a commercial process. Uh, it has been used by companies to produce these smart systems or smart coatings uh, in the applications. So my last slide is to talk about the fact that uh, I went through the second half rather quickly. The first half was to do layers. The second half was to do patterning with masking. The third is to actually print. You can combine all of these essentially with one process to create a host of functional materials and multi layers. And this represent, I would say, the next, you know, we can rethink the next 20, 30 years of thermal spray using these concepts. So with that, I'll finish by saying that thermal spray is an intrinsically layered manufacturing process, most of which is unintentional. However, by combining the unique capabilities, we can do all kinds of uh, novel material assembly as part of the process. With that, I'll uh, thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take uh, uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Absolutely wonderful talk. P please leave your slides up there in case anyone wishes to uh, want you to jump back or forth. I, I do have a ton of questions, so let me start with some. Uh, here's an interesting question. How about working in confined spaces with thermal spray? This is very much an, an occupational health and safety question. So from the practical concepts, how easy or how hard is it to actually implement thermal spray in a working environment? Yeah, so there is a lot of history on that one going back 50, 60 years when they were doing coatings on these, uh, what they call Yankee dryers to, in the, uh, for the paper machinery and then the coal um, uh, boilers. A lot of these were confined spaces. And uh, in the old days, people actually wore suits and things of that kind. And I, we know, uh, Chris and I know people who actually suffered uh, having sprayed nickel for long periods of time in the old days that people didn't understand. So a lot of those things were very difficult to achieve, um, um, but were, were successfully achieved with, you know, with some, some challenges. I would say now robotics has come a long way. Um, and so there is no fundamental reason why we cannot do these things in confined geometry. In fact, I was part of a proposal recently to do things like pipelines where to insert things and turn and rotate and things like that. The best example is the cylinder bore of a car, right? I mean, every single BMW and Mercedes Benz, if you drive one of those things, or even Volkswagens, now have the rotating spray bore. So fundamentally, it becomes a design of the mechanical parts, slip rings, uh, you know, uh, and all of the, the flow things and robotics. The, I think in principle, there's no reason uh, you can't do this on compact. You cannot, you need line of sight. That's critical. You can't do like vapor phase. Okay. But in principle, we can do lots of fine geometries. Well, let's move on to the million dollar question. Is the field of bond coat research saturated? Uh, uh, well, yes and no. So let me put answer the question that's relevant from some discussions that we had. So I'm I'm kind of prepared to answer this. So that makes it easier. One is, you know, in, in the old days, what had happened was, as the temperatures got higher and higher, you needed better and better bond coats. They added reactive elements and precious metals and so on and so forth. But now, what has happened with the success of TBCs? The temperatures are coming down. So people are actually going backwards to say, you know what? I don't need these fancy alloys. I don't need platinum. I don't need hafnium. But how can I make these things as durable with lower cost materials? So that was a recent uh, development in, um, in the turbine industry. We were part of a program with Oak Ridge on, on this exact subject. Uh, that's one answer to the question. The second is we are uh, eagerly awaiting <coughs> answer. Uh, the, we are part of a big proposal on the next generation turbine materials and coatings. There's an ARPA E uh, competition, which is in the final stage actually, where they're talking about going to completely new alloys and composites, not, not necessarily composite alloys, 
uh, which means there'll be a whole new genre of bond codes that will be needed. Okay. So that is just starting. So and some, of your, uh, some of your high entropy things are being contemplated there. So the, the next question is referring to the last part of your talk. So we're jumping around here to keep you alert. Okay. Uh, it's referring to the PM type connectors. So the question is that because thermal spray uh, is carried out at high temperatures, what sort of materials can you choose to have the correct phase changes within the 3D architecture? So how do you control the processing so that you've got the right materials for these PM type connectors? Is that a clear question for you? Yes, it is. And I would say this is probably uh, even building these architectures is uh, not. I mean, there are challenges and I'll come to that in a second, but I think the material science is the most complicated. So even in this example that I'm showing with the TiO2 minus X, we, we, we arrived at it by accident. It was serendipitous discovery, but then we tried to optimize and we really struggled because you need the right combination of chemistry, but then and with that right combination chemistry, you can also create other attributes like interfaces and cracks and so on and so forth. So material science is hard. We this in this particular example, we arrived at it by accident. We made a P material, which was the, in this case not shown here. I, I took it out in the interest of time, but we have published papers on calcium cobaltite, C8, uh, I forget CaCO2O5. Um, and that material um, was deliberate. So we actually made powders ourselves and uh, Hwasu Li did this and then uh, processed it to achieve the correct phase, the correct uh, stoichiometry and it, we achieved a ZT of 0.27, probably again the best from any, any processing technique that is out there. So you have to be very uh, uh, intelligent about the combination of materials and process condition to achieve the required phase and stoichiometry. A lot of materials will not work easily, um, and a lot of materials have problems like silicon, for example. We did a lot of work on silicon thermoelectrics with very little success because the resistivity was too high. So it, it, we got, we stumbled on this by luck, but there are materials that will work, and there are a lot of materials that will not work. Okay, so here's a question from Kentaro. Uh, okay. who is gl gl absolutely glad to see the background of Stony Brook in your office. Mm. So here's his question. Which direction are you willing to go with thermal spray? Increasing the high temperature capacity, increasing the EBC capability, or integrating these systems with thermal spray sensors towards the Internet of Things or AI? So there's three directions. Is it going to be increasing high temperature? increasing EBC or going towards sensing it up for uh, Internet of Things and AI. Is that a clear question for you, Sanjay? It is. It's uh, it's a kind of a loaded question, but uh, let me <laughs> see if I can take a crack at it. Um, I, I don't want to say all of the above, which is a natural instinct for all of us academics because we love playing in the mud. Uh, I think I think the landscape of high temperatures and ultra high temperatures, I think is starting to saturate. Companies are more interested in durability and cost. And so, um, or, or density, for example, the real advantage for EBCs and CMC may be less so with temperature, but more so with density because it makes things lightweight. So are there ways I can extract more uh, capability of the system not necessarily always by temperature, because temperature, as you get hotter, all kinds of compounding problems start to take place. So that's, that's just my personal view, point of view. Relative to Internet of Things and AI and all that, um, I think uh, our first goal should be to make things reliable and robust. And that's a, one of the problems, I think, in thermal spray, and we're all to blame for this, and we're all to be happy about this both ways. We are always looking for new processes and new new materials. Uh, sometimes we need to take a step back and ask ourselves the question, what's really needed out there? And what I've heard from talking to a lot of the companies is they want education in an easy to swallow way, right? Number one, because we don't teach things like thermal spray in easily to in, in schools because it's a complicated process. 
Second thing is they want durability, uh, robust and reliable process with easy to use tools, easy to use design of these things. And then eventually, if all of that works out, then you could use things like uh, this embedded sensors concept, uh, but it will be mostly at the test say scale, not always at the um, utilization scale, because what have we found is cost has become an overdriving factor these days in decision making, cost and ease of application. In both of those things, we are not that good and we should try and improve that. OK, so please go to your slide with Fitz Prince and the masking of sensors from uh, Carnegie Mellon. So on printing sensors, you mentioned that you are not doing it via Metascribe by using a masking technology. So now the question is, how do you control spray footprint and the term over, overstay or overspray? OK, so uh, that's a yeah, that th so there is a uh, we use like a, I, I give a broad answer because some of this tends to get proprietary and always complicates life. But essentially, we use what we call a cascading set of apertures or masks, not masks, a cascading apertures. So the mask has to be physically on the part. We use masking of the torch in some way. And for that to happen, we need high temperature material. We have some dynamic attributes to it, and uh, it is extremely precisely engineered with robotics. And that's where DARPA funding came in. It was a lot of uh, money plus really smart people like Rob who built these things. So essentially, we don't do any masking on the on the part, which is what Weiss and Prince did, and also what. Uh, uh, Huasu and others did on our uh, thermoelectric device. So we basically uh, make a torch that's also significantly smaller in footprint and, and size. You can't have a big torch and try to do this. So we developed a process called mesoplasma, which is basically a really tiny plasma torch, maybe a few millimeters in uh, our process. And then we added this, what we call dynamic uh, aperturing system that has got water cooling and and flow managements and precision opening dimensions and and things of that kind. I know it's a kind of a long winded hand waving answer, but if the person wants to contact me, I will at least share the patent with them so then he can try and figure that out from there. It's expiring in a few years so they can try to replicate it. OK, so a kind of a follow up question, which is a little bit more generic for these sorts of projects that you've described, Sanjay, what sort of timelines do projects like plasma spray thermoelectrics or plasma spray pen conform to? Uh, what sort of timelines are you talking about? How long does it take to develop to come to the solution? Yeah, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I teach a class called Innovation and Engineering System, or I used to, and any good engineering problem takes 15 years to even start to see the realization of an idea. So uh, relative to thermoelectrics, maybe we, uh, let's start with, with Mesoscribe and the embedded, right? So it was started in 1999-2000. It became a viable technology maybe 2008-2009, and it started to get more traction maybe 2014 or something like that. So you're 2016. So you're talking about 15 to 16 years. The thermoelectric works we started maybe five or six years ago. We are kind of at the crossroads. We don't have specific funding for it, and we don't have a specific pathway to succeed with it immediately in terms of power harvesting. We're looking at other applications like thermopiles right now for sensing. So I would say uh, if you had the requisite knowledge when experience and you have a very clear driving force from industry, things happen fast. But if you're trying to push bottom up, uh, nothing takes, I mean, 15, 20 years. I mean, Chris may appreciate this, that when we when we were doing all of these things 25 years ago, I don't think we understood a fraction of what we understand today, but, but we had sustained funding and a lot of us stayed in the same field for a long time. And that we were a beneficiary of not wander, wandering around different fields, but focusing on the subject and we are starting to slowly but surely realize the benefits. But I think 
Every engineering takes time. Thermal space is too complicated to do things quickly. Okay, so I'm going to ask two more questions, and then I will close off with a question, if I may. Okay. I'm first of all going to take you back to your GE Sylvania days. Where resistant coatings of potassium carbide, cobalt, chrome carbide, nickel chrome, and the question is, why not silicon carbide metal matrix compos composites? Um, yeah, first of all, I think uh, um, these these cemented carbides, as we call them, you have to go back in history. What had ended up happening was that uh, tungsten carbide cobalt was used in cutting tools in the 40s and 50s and those 1940s, 1950s. And essentially what the thermal spray industry tried to do was simply take that and try to convert that into a coating. And so a lot of these coatings and materials, and somebody asked about time, uh, I would I have a book here, Herb Herman gave it to me, 90% of the materials that we use today were in a book in that book in the 1960s. So uh, it's very humbling, but there's always a reason why something starts in a particular way. And um, tungsten carbide started that way. I do not know the origins of chrome carbide, nickel chrome, but uh, things like silicon carbide, by itself was not easy to do for reason that there was a lot of sublimation that took place. Um, and um, I, I think, but now we know a lot more about it. These materials are more readily available. Uh, I would say that it is definitely worth looking at because it is significantly lower in density. So I would okay. say that there is an opportunity to change because tungsten is expensive. And so there may be ways to fix that with lower cost lower uh, density materials. OK, we've got one final technical question before we get to my philosophical question. Uh, this is from Andrew. Why not SPS for 3D printing? SPS for 3D printing um, of ceramics. Can, sorry, can you comment on uh, suspension plasma spray or solution precursor plasma spray for 3D printing? Yeah, I, I don't I don't quite make the connection. So basically for 3D printing, you need precision path. So you need a torch that will do things like what I'm showing in this example with the mesoscribe type device. Uh, suspension plasma spray tends to open up quite quite a bit. So trying to confine that may be very difficult because the inertia is extremely low for the particles. So I don't know how you would project them. Um, so I would say that the real opportunity for SPS and SPPS or whatever, in fact, precursor plasma spray is what Chris started uh, 25, 30 years ago, that those processes I think are very suitable for doing functional materials because they tend to be thinner because they're more expensive. Remember, I, I always bring up this word that cost is an overriding factor for a lot of applications. So I think it's very hard to justify it for things like TBCs when you want to make a thick coating. But if you're trying to make a phosphor, or if you're trying to make a sensor, or if you're trying to make a very thin electrolyte material, I think that's where those processes can really excel. Um, I would say great for layered manufacturing. I'm not so sure for, for additive or 3D printing. I don't know how we would couple that with a robot. Okay, well, I'm going to now ask my final philosophical question. And this is going to be aimed at the early career researchers whom we define as the postgraduate students and as the young postdoctoral fellows. Mm -hmm. So my question, Sanjay, is on the basis of your experience, what is, and this is a, this is a tough one, what is a single most piece of advice that you could give these young people who can conquer the world what is a single piece of advice that you can give these young people so that they can conquer the world? OK, so if I were to give uh, sort of my experience, and I think Chris is, uh, uh, I mean, I, I learned from Chris, so it's a gl close analogy. I think one of the most important lessons that at least I've learned is you have to stick with things for long periods of time because there's a maturation of ideas that take a long time to come together. Uh, I mean, Kentaro's on the call and I can, you know, he and I, we worked on certain certain attributes 12 years ago, and all of a sudden we are seeing opportunities to revisit some of those things. 
similarly with Alfredo and others. Even SPS, uh, you know, go, it goes back to the work, Chris, that you did, or even what Rich Neiser did before that with suspensions and you did with solutions. So my most important advice is we tend to respond to GWIS publications, nature materials and things like that, that comes in and says, oh, we've come up with this next great thermoelectric materials. You know how many times I've seen papers on the next great thermoelectric material that has never been realized? I think this, the biggest advice I'd like to give to the younger people, which I do unabashedly, uh, both here and at home with my kids and everything, is that I think moving around in fields is, you never learn the subject, you become the jack of all, master of none. I think there is a lot of value in sticking with the field, but you have to obviously pick a field that's going to remain for a long time. If you, if you pick a field that's not going to be around forever, uh, then um, then that's a problem. But you know, pick a field that's going to be around in the future, and do deep dives, and and learn it in a lot of depth. And I think that's that's the key to long. You want to succeed when you're in your 50s, not necessarily in your 30s, because that's when all the ideas come together. Okay, so we started a little bit a little bit late, and now we're finishing a little bit late. I'd like us all to give Professor Sampath a, a communal clap. Uh, absolutely magnificent talk. Uh, the graphics presentation, absolutely wonderful. And I'd like to think that the ECRs have learned something from the presentation. I definitely have. Uh, because we're always learning. The questions from the audience from around the world, absolutely fantastic. I could not go through all of them. Some of them have been published, but we've gone from topic A, B to Z, and Professor Sunbath, Sunpath has been fielding balls left, right and centre. So Sanjay, thank you very much for your time. The formal part of this presentation will now, will now close down. Thank you very much, John and Vesna. John, please close us down. And the um, group of four. Chris, uh, Chris, one second. In case uh, I, I can send some of these papers off to Vesna, so in case anybody asks, she can pass them along. No problems. Okay. No problems Thanks at all. Again. Thank you, Vesna. Thank you, John.